This took place when I was 14 years old, camping in a little area of land in western Maryland, where lots of my mom's family had little cabins. This was in the middle of nowhere, on private property, and everyone on the mountain was related to us one way or another. We grew up spending the summers around the campfire, telling scary stories, and running around with all of my cousins. Quick explanation of the layout. Imagine a large capital T for a road. Above the T, by 150 feet, ran Savage River. If you went left on the T, it would take you past multiple family houses, but also dense forests that cut off the road. If you went all the way to the right of the T, was my mom's tiny little cabin, where we lived. I often went off on my own, preferring it that way. I was about to do just that when my aunt had asked to tag along. She was 14 years older than I am. She had pink hair at the time, was covered in tattoos, and was almost six feet tall, so not an easily intimidated woman. So I had decided that we would go all the way to the left of the dense forest, and she was cool with that, admitting that she would come with me so she could smoke a joint and keep out of eyesight of my disapproving grandmother. Now, I was a good kid, and even though she offered me a hit off the joint, drugs scared the hell out of me, so I declined. From the end of the road was a super rough dirt path into the woods, with the river still running 150 feet above the path. If you were to walk towards the river, it goes on a downward slope. A few miles in, you would actually come across one of those legendary, random staircases that lead to nowhere. On this particular day, I had taken the dirt path and had walked down the 150 feet along the river, watching the fish and crawdads scurry by as my aunt got high as a kite a little bit behind me. I was in my own little world when I suddenly heard a click noise that brought me back to reality. I looked up and around, confused. Then my eyes landed on some man that I had never seen before, standing across the river, no more than 15 feet away. He must have just walked out of the woods on the other side of the river. It's summer, but he was wearing a black jacket and raggedy old jeans, and was holding one of those old cheap non-digital yellow cameras that you would roll the top and it would click to be able to take another picture. I was stunned because I had never seen anyone other than my family anywhere around the area in all the years that I had been going up there. The man smiled at me, and then slightly lowered his camera. He was older, probably forties, and very scruffy, tall and thin. He took a step forward, and I in turn took a step back. He scrolled the top of the camera and points it directly at me. I am literally at a loss of words and can only manage to take another step back, almost slipping on a rock as I do. That's when my aunt stumbles through the trees and is in mid-sentence about how she missed being high when she stopped and saw the man, frozen like a deer in headlights. I slowly turned, and he's not looking at my aunt. He's staring at me. He clicks the camera again, and then he does something that makes my blood run cold and turns the situation from weird to terrifying. He brings his finger up to his throat and does that slicing motion. That's the moment that I went into autopilot. I spun around and began barreling through the trees, grabbing onto my aunt. My heart pounded as I ran, though I could have sworn I heard one more click before I could hear the splashing from behind me. I almost collapsed because my legs felt like jelly. The river is really deep in parts, but where I had been, we were at a point where the water would have been only thigh deep to a grown man. I tore upwards and ran blindly, like a rabbit from a fox. We saw the stairs, and my aunt quickly yanked me to the other side and slid down beside me as we caught our breath. I was wheezing so loud that I had to cover my mouth to muffle the sound. I peered around, but the trees are so dense that I can't see the river from the stairs. But even with my hammering heartbeat, 
I hear the snapping of branches, like someone barreling through the forest. Now, I am very scared. It's not an easy straight trail back into my family property. You have to weave around, and in spots, it dips and gets rocky, so you have to do like an S-shape to get through. There's random rocks everywhere, and it would have been so easy to twist an ankle in my panic. Not to mention that we always treaded carefully and looked where we were going, because there's so many snakes in that area. I'm sobbing and wheezing badly, and we had another few miles until we would even hit the first part of my family property. My mind is racing, but I know that we can't stay. Neither of us had any type of weapon, and staying here was making it harder for me to convince myself to run as paralyzing terror crept in. My legs and arms are already cut up, and before I can decide what to do, my aunt pulls me towards the T road, desperately, just stumbling and running. I don't make it more than another mile until I misstep and trip over a branch, tripping and smacking headfirst into a tree. I crumple over and taste blood. During the fall, I had bit my lip. I'm dazed, but my adrenaline is still pumping, so I scramble to a tree as my aunt turns and notices that I'm not right behind her. She scrambles back and drops to her knees in front of me, whispering. I'm dazed, but she keeps repeating that we need to keep moving. I'm shaking so bad that I don't think I can walk, much less run. I have probably another mile and a half until I'm on my family's property, but another two until we're at an occupied cabin, my grandmother's. My ears are ringing and I'm hardly paying attention to my aunt's frantic pleas. I completely psych myself out again and keep looking behind me, but I don't see anything. She decides that she's not going to waste any more time because of stupid me and half drags me up and forward. I hobble forward as quick as I can as she continues to pull me. The rest is a blur until we break through the woods. Most of my family wasn't there at the time, so we only stop when we make it to my grandmother's, and I just run inside, sobbing. No one locks their doors around there, and my grandmother takes one horrified look at me and my aunt, who is equally cut up and scared looking, and yells for my grandfather, who promptly takes over and grabs his rifle. I can't put into sentences what just happened to my aunt, my grandfather and grandmother go cabin to cabin gathering the men and their guns, as well as warning the women and children about what just occurred. There's no signal up there, so calling the sheriff wasn't an option, and to get up to the mountain if they left immediately would take over an hour. It's getting dark, and the roads leading up to the property are so windy and steep that you would have to be out of your mind to try and drive up them in the dark. My mother eventually got word and came over. She took one look at my aunt and said that I probably just got high with her, which in turn made us overly paranoid, and we saw the random fisherman who was trespassing. We jumped to conclusions and had probably startled him as much as he had startled us. She continued by saying I probably just imagined he was taking my picture, or that he had begun chasing us. My aunt stood up and yelled at my mother, saying that I was a good kid and didn't do anything, and that we were telling the truth. They began screaming at each other, and my grandmother made them both stop, telling them to grow up. Even with the men of my family scouring the woods, they never saw any sign of the man that we encountered. Everyone on the mountain locked their doors that night, for the first time in a long time. And to this day, all I can wonder is if I'm a part of some weird, creepy picture collection. But considering what could have happened if I had been alone like normal, I can live with that. This story happened to me December of 2018. I am a recent Navy veteran and has seen and dealt with a lot of situations 
which made it to where I don't scare easily. Just some insight on me. I am now a 28 year old male, athletic build, ready to take on the world since leaving the military. For this story, we'll say my name is Ron. I started working as a security guard in a Michigan mall, and I was loving my job and the people that I worked with. The night of the 23rd, I was scheduled to work my first overnight shift, which only consisted of one officer for eight or nine hours. I didn't think much of it, so I clock in for my shift at 10 p.m. and get everything ready for the night. My first walk around through the mall, I verify that all the doors are locked, make sure no one is in the mall, and I hit all my checkpoints. The night is running smooth. Around 2 a.m., I start making my way around the mall again to do another check. I'm making my way to center court, where we have our Santa set up, and as I round the corner I froze to what I can only describe as pure terror. About 30 feet from me, I can see a man wearing a Santa hat holding a machete. He had this evil look on his face like he was there to do one thing, to kill me. I froze, sitting there thinking about what I should do next. All I had was a radio and handcuffs. This man had a machete. I did not want to come into contact with him. But I knew there was a good chance that I could outrun him to the safety of my locked office. I knew all the shortcuts and back halls like the back of my hand. Then, an arcade game started playing music, which I guess caught the guy off guard, as he took his eyes off me for a second, and once he did, I made a run for it. As I'm running, I can hear him right behind me. Get back here! Not once did I stop. I ran and dodged around the corners and bounded through the halls as fast as I could. I make the final turn to the hallway that my office was in. I had one chance to type my lock code in the door, get in, and shut the door before he got to me. I finally made it to the door and can still hear him as he's now laughing, hysterically. I quickly and flawlessly punch my code in jump into the office and slam the door shut behind me. Two seconds pass and the guy slams into the door. I am so glad that that door was reinforced. Suddenly the banging stops. I look to the monitor and he is standing right in front of the door. Mr. Security Guard, let's make this fast. It will only hurt for a second. I'm freaked out at this point because his intentions are clear. It didn't occur to me right then to call the police. I don't know why. I decided to wait him out. An hour goes by and he still hasn't moved. I feel safe in the office, but eventually people are going to start showing up to open shops. I have to do something. I finally called the police. They said that they had an officer right down the street. I was so thankful when I heard the siren and watched the man run outside. I watched him on the cameras as he ended up running right into two huge linebacker officers. He never stood a chance. After that night, I refused to work night shift and actually left that job two months later. But I will never forget that night or that voice. Mr. Security Guard. I was 17 years old working at a Best Buy near the mall. I had started at Sears and later transferred to Best Buy. I was still in high school at the time, so I would typically work from 4.30 to 9 or 5 o'clock to 9 o'clock. We closed at 9 o'clock, so I took whatever I could get. I worked in the appliance section, so my main job was working with customers to choose the correct appliance for them. One Wednesday, a normal shift began just like any other day during the week. It was dead. I hadn't sold a single thing all night. I planned on a nice, easy, last two hours. I'm just biding my time 
watching the minutes tick by when the bell on our door jingles. A man comes through wearing a red hoodie and khaki pants. He started heading directly towards the appliances with his head down, but walking with determination. Oh, a customer, I thought to myself. He walked into the department right past me, with not the slightest bit of interest in his surroundings. I watched him as he walked past some stoves, and then moved over to the refrigerators. He was just strolling along, stopping every now and then to open a door or rub his hand along something. He started making his way into the area where I was keeping busy when he crossed into my five foot radius. Five feet and greet. Five tile and smile. Basically meaning that if someone is five feet away, you smile at them and say hello, welcome to Best Buy. How can I help you? Is there something I can do for you? So that is what I did. I greeted him like I was supposed to. Just like I was taught to do. He looked in my direction and he smiled slightly and said that he was just browsing. So I continued with the project I was working on, waiting him out. I would occasionally glance in his direction to keep tabs on him, but my main focus was the clock and getting home. Suddenly, I realized an hour had passed since the man entered my department. This brought it to almost 8 o'clock, only one hour before closing, and time to finally go home. So I approached the man one more time, irritated, and slightly concerned now by his lingering. Again, there were no other customers in the store, and there were only a handful of employees left as well. He was still in the same area that he had been an hour prior. As I walked up to him, I once again asked, Are you sure there's nothing I can help you with? Are you looking for something specific? He looked up at me for the first time, and I met the eyes coming out front, beneath the hood. The next words out of his mouth made my blood run cold. He casually said, I am in here for you. This guy just told me that he was in here, in the store, for me? What the hell? This freaked me out. I had no idea who this man was. I had never seen him before. What was he doing here? What did he want me for? There is no logical explanation that I could think of. I am a 17 year old girl. This is a grown man. So I obviously start backing away and decide to contact my manager immediately. So I put my hand over my earpiece and as calmly as I can, I manage to say, Hey, Brian, where are you? Scratch that. Can you come over here by me? Never mind, scratch that too. I'm coming to you. So I turn around without saying another word, moving as quickly as I can without actually running to go find Brian. I am eager to explain what the hell just happened to me. I located him fairly quickly and told him what occurred between the strange man that I had never seen before and myself. This definitely freaked him out too. He confessed that he had never had to deal with something like this before. He felt that the safest thing was for me to just go home. He didn't want to have to deal with an even worse situation by keeping me here. I didn't have a problem with this, of course, since I had a 30 minute drive ahead of me back home anyway. I started walking towards the back to gather my things and head out. I started feeling slightly better as I saw no sign of the man anywhere, so I headed toward the front of the store as I normally did, ready to get the hell out of there. As I headed to the door, and I very distinctly remember this final moment of peace, as I turned around one last time and saw Brian's neck erect scanning the store. We made eye contact and he nodded gently in my direction. I nodded back in agreement that the coast was clear and turned back around heading out the door towards the parking lot. I was about halfway to my car when my blood ran cold 
for the second time that night. Brian's voice came booming across the parking lot. Casey, run! I turn around to see what the hell was happening, and I shit you not, this man was coming for me. The loss prevention guy was standing in front of the store, trying to prevent this guy from getting out. The creeper shoves the loss prevention guy out of the way like it's nothing, smashing his head. This man is now hauling ass out the door, arms pumping. There was nothing anyone could do to help at this point. I turned around and started hauling ass to get as much distance between this psycho and myself. Thankfully, he is parked on the other side of the parking lot, so there is no way he could know what my car looks like. I mean, he could. I don't know what this crazy man knows or is thinking. But if he did, why didn't he park right next to me to begin with? I finally get back to my car and rip the door open. I shove the key in and burned rubber out of my spot like my life depended on it. At this point, I'm pretty sure it did. I tore through the parking lot. This asshole is right behind me in a big black truck. I pulled into the loop that circles the mall, trying to be as careful as possible to not make things worse. I keep up with the curves, taking them with ease, showing my familiarity. And I think that that was the thing that saved me that night. I watched as the truck struggled to keep up with the curves, and the distance between us grew. I was finally getting away from this lunatic. I felt my heartbeat starting to slow as I hit green lights. I took a deep breath as I cruised onto the highway, peering back into my rearview mirror. I sighed the biggest breath of relief as I realized I had finally lost him. I returned my eyes back to the road in front of me, trying to wrap my brain around what the hell just happened. I don't know that I will ever look at a big black truck the same ever again. You never know who is walking past you, or what their intentions are. What if I hadn't lost him when I did? What if he was parked right next to me? What if? Back in 2013, when my ex and myself first met, we would grab snacks, blankets, and pillows, load them into the bed of his white Chevy pickup truck, and drive until daylight. We lived in a very rural small town in Alberta. We lived roughly 45 minutes to an hour from the city. Being small town, bored, young adults, we had nothing better to do than drive late at night. We made it a game to find this movie television set that was near our small town. We would get lost on gravel roads, on our quest to hopefully stumble upon this set. Of course, being young and dumb, thought that it would be better to locate this set late at night, in hopes of not getting caught trespassing. We probably drove every back road searching and searching. One night, on our hunt, we drove through this gully, and it became dark. Like dark to the point that it was completely black. Our headlights flooded into nothingness. We always had the radio blasting off of our iPod. Suddenly, it was as if we picked up some kind of radio station that was just blaring gibberish. I go to reach the volume button to turn it down. It shocked me as if I was touching pure electricity. Then, one voice came through. Hell. It echoed through the speakers. A few seconds passed and it went back to the song that we were listening to. To this day, we have no idea what our radio picked up. What's scary is this back road was very close to an astrophysical observatory. Was it something trying to communicate, or just radio static? I found it kind of coincidental that the only word that came through was hell. I don't think I'll ever know 
nor will I drive down that particular road ever again. This story happened around 2001 or 2002, an incident that had been long forgotten. At the time, I live in southern Ohio in a small town. We lived about 45 minutes outside of town, in the middle of nowhere, where seeing people on the roads or in the area was extremely rare. We had one neighbor about a quarter mile down the road to the right, and then a large Amish family who lived a few miles in the opposite direction. At the time, I was around 12 years old. I was outside in my football gear, taking the dog out to the bathroom and messing around in the yard, practicing for my game later that morning. Now, to describe the area more to help understand things better, we lived on a large farmland that we rented that sat on about 150 acres. On the road, the direction that would eventually lead you to the Amish family home was going up a small hill and about 100 yards that direction, the road made a sharp right turn into a heavily wooded area where you could not see the road or anything other than trees. With being such an empty area, you couldn't see much, but was so quiet that you could hear cars coming well before you actually saw them. This is a short story. The details I'm giving are to help explain why the situation bothers me so much now so please bear with me. As I'm outside, I look up the road to see a man hobbling down the road in our direction. He sees me and waves. I yell for my mom, as it's just me and her home at the time, and it was rare to see someone walking so far out in the middle of the road. As he gets closer, I can see that he seems to be in pain, and his clothes are rather worn and ripped up. My mom comes outside just about the time he gets to the house. He begins to tell her that he was just in an accident around the turn and needed help. My mom says that she will grab the phone and he can sit on the chair on the porch and rest. He asks to come in the house and tries to reassure her that there will be no problem. He's just in a lot of pain and wants to rest. My mom gets a look on her face and says, that he cannot come in the house, she is not comfortable with that, and that he can stay on the porch while she fetches the phone. He reluctantly does, and my mom shoots me a glance that I took as keep an eye on him. At this time I was pretty young, but I had a bit of a growth spur early in life, and with being only 12, I was roughly 6 foot, pushing 300 pounds, and this man was about 5'10", and he was rather skinny. As she went inside, I'm looking at him. Though his clothes are torn and raggedy, it does not look that he was in an accident. There was also no blood, no cuts, not a single mark anywhere that I could see. He starts to ask if anyone was home as he starts looking through the door inside, kind of peeking around, and I say no, but that my dad would be home soon. My mom comes back out and tells him the cordless phone is dead and she will use the old rotary phone that my dad refused to get rid of and asks if he would like her to call 911 or any of his family. The man stands up and again asks to come inside. He starts walking to the door and my mom tells him no, that he is not welcome to come in. He then asks if he can come in and use the bathroom because he really needs to pee. Again, my mom says no, and he's welcome to go across the street to pee in the bushes. He then asks if he can come in to have some water. My mom says no again, and tells him that she will get him a glass of water. With a huff of frustration, my mom turns around to go get him the water. She returns with the glass of water and dad's shotgun, and places it by the door on the inside of the house, not trying to hide it at all, and the man sees this, and I watch as his eyes become wide, and he starts to become fidgety. She comes out to hand him the glass, and asks who she can call for him. The man stands up and says that he will be fine, and not to worry. He'll figure it out and walks away in the direction that he had come from. My mom watches him leave. 
I didn't really understand what was going on and was actually worried that the man was not going to be okay. He said that he had flipped his car and it eventually came to a stop against the trees. My mom said something was off and asked if I had heard anything before he showed up. I said no, that things were silent as they always were, never even hearing a car coming. She stares for a few seconds, telling me to stay outside for a little longer and to keep an eye out until Dad gets home, which should be any minute, and if the man comes back, that she left the shotgun by the door, and if I see him, to grab it and yell for her. I am confused at this point, but I tell her that I will as she goes inside. I watch as the man goes around the turn and disappears. About a minute later, my dad comes around that same turn and finally gets home. I go to him and tell him what just happened, and I only got a couple words in when my mom comes out and starts explaining it. After she was done, he asks what direction the guy came. She tells him which way, and he gets a confused look on his face. My mom asks what is it, and my dad begins to say that he had just came from that area and there was no man on the road, and no vehicle anywhere. Nothing about this at all was normal. My mom got a worried look on her face, and they go inside, and that was the end of the situation for me. I have no idea what they talked about, if they called anyone or anything. I almost immediately forgot about it all, and I was excited for my football and was ready to get going. I am almost 30 years old now, and never thought of this until a couple of weeks ago, when hearing a story which triggered my memory. I asked my dad if he remembered, but of course he didn't. He has a terrible memory and it wasn't a situation that he was really a part of. My mom passed away a few years ago, so I don't have the chance to ask her about it. But thinking about it now, I can't help but wonder what was really going on. Why was he trying to get inside the house? Was he trying to rob us? Was he trying to hurt us? Or was the man telling the truth and became scared at the sight of the shotgun? And if he was being honest, where the hell did he go, and why did my dad not see him? Where was the accident? It doesn't make sense to me, and it has me thinking and trying to figure it out. Were we in danger, or did we just scare the man who had just had a possibly deadly accident? I've always been a fan of horror stories and true crime, which is why it was so strange to have my own experience. So, a little background on me. I'm a 20-year-old male college student. I attend a local community college and live at home. My local area includes garbage pickup, but here's the problem. We have a really big piece of property. Our driveway is a good long walk from the house itself. We normally throw garbage into the garbage cans that are just outside of our house. And then on garbage days, I have to take the garbage cans all the way down near the road so the garbage man gets them. It's a little bit of an inconvenience, but it's not the end of the world. Some of my friends have to bring their own garbage to the local garbage dump, and I'm just happy that I don't have to put any of this trash in my car. If you're a college student, you probably understand the struggle of maintaining a healthy sleep schedule. If I'm going to be honest with you, I really don't have one. I kind of sleep when I'm tired, and I'm awake when I'm not. Sometimes I get my schoolwork done early in the morning, like 3 a.m., and sometimes it's in the afternoon after class. It really just depends. My horror story begins with me bringing down the garbage cans late one night. What almost always happens is that I don't remember to bring down the cans until the night before, at like 11 p.m., or sometimes even later. This means that I'm making multiple trips back and forth, carrying heavy garbage cans in the pitch black night. I mentioned that I like horror earlier, but I don't consider myself to be someone that's scared easily. The night 
where the darkness does not scare me very much. I've had a few experiences that will all hear a noise or imagine that I see something out of the corner of my eye, but it's never been anything horrible. I never imagined that I would have a bad experience carrying the garbage cans until this night. It was around 2 a.m., and I was moving a really heavy can of trash. It felt like it was at least 70 pounds, full of cat litter. Why, you might ask? My family has five cats. Don't ask. That wouldn't have been an issue, but all of this cat litter was in the worst trash can that we had. The wheels both fell off, and the handlebar rips off sometimes if you pull it too hard. So I was pulling this ridiculously heavy garbage can, full of cat litter, that stinks to the high heavens. I get about halfway down my driveway, and the handlebar rips off. The entire can fell over, and at least one third of everything came out into the driveway. I cursed under my breath, and just stood there for a moment, wondering what I was going to do now. My best idea was to sweep it back into the trash can. So I started making my way back up the driveway. I didn't walk very far before something possessed me to stop and turn around. I had this strange feeling that I was being watched. I turned my head and saw a light coming from my neighbor's house. And all the time that I have been doing the garbage at night, I have never seen this neighbor up that late before. I was pretty sure it was an older man. He had to have been at least 60 years old. So it was kind of a surprise to see a light on in his house. It was on the second floor, maybe in his bedroom window. His house was on the other side of the road, and it was about 10 feet away from the road, so it was a good distance between me and him. I just remember feeling really freaked out that there was someone else awake and watching me. What possible reason could he have had for being awake at 2 in the morning? I stood there for a moment, wondering to myself. I was just kind of staring at the window. Again, there was a good bit of distance, and I couldn't see all too clearly. But I felt my heart drop when I saw him walk away from the window. I wasn't exactly sure, but the way he moved made me think that he was standing at his window watching me. I tried telling myself that he was just an old man and that I must have woken him up or something dropping this garbage can. I got the broom, started sweeping the cat litter back into the can, and then brought it next to the road. I felt his eyes on me the rest of the night, even after he turned off his light. And that was the night everything changed. Every time I took the garbage can down after this point, I noticed him watching me. I even started mixing up the times when I would bring the garbage down, and it didn't matter if it was 2 p.m. or 2 a.m. He would always be there, watching. It was around this time that I also noticed that there must have been a different garbage man. The old guy used to get the garbage out of the can and throw the garbage can itself and the lid on the ground in a really sloppy way. I didn't really blame him. It must suck to be a garbage man. But I did appreciate that this new guy was making the effort to put the lid back on the garbage can neatly. It makes my life easier to just grab them and bring them back up to the house. This was a pleasant change, but it didn't calm my nerves one bit from being watched. I started getting really freaked out. I asked my parents about what I should do, and they told me that I was just being paranoid, that he was an older, retired gentleman and probably doesn't have anything better to do. If I'm going to be honest with you, I don't care how bored or unoccupied someone's time is. I don't think there's a person on earth that would go out of their way to watch their neighbor take out the garbage if there wasn't some kind of reason for it. This went on for the rest of the summer and into the next semester. I started getting frustrated with the whole situation. It still made me feel really uneasy. I read about stalking laws to see if I could report him for something. I really couldn't do anything because he never actually left his own property. He just always happened to be around when I started moving the garbage. Fall break came around 
and I decided that I was going to make a change. I was going to watch him instead. My bedroom just happened to be on the side of the house that I could see his house from my bedroom window. I found a pair of binoculars in the basement, and after bringing the garbage can down at 4 a.m. one night, I got situated next to the window and began watching this old man. He didn't turn out his bedroom light like usual, and it seemed like he was just sitting there. A half hour must have gone by before I started getting really sleepy. This guy was just sitting there doing nothing, watching the garbage. I was just about to go to bed when I noticed that he left his bedroom. I tried paying attention to any of the other lights turning on in his house, but he didn't seem to turn any of them on. I looked closely to notice any kind of changes. About 40 seconds went by and I thought I had completely lost him. I didn't see him anywhere. I just concluded that he was some kind of schizophrenic freak and that this was just a waste of my time. Before putting the binoculars down, I looked down at the garbage pail and noticed that they were gone. I got really confused for a minute and had no idea what was going on. I waited a few more minutes to see that the old man was carrying what looked like my garbage cans out in front of his own house. He placed them exactly where they had been before. I waited about 40 minutes for him to go to bed. I was only sure that he was asleep after the light in his bedroom went out. I rushed down to the garbage cans and was shocked when I noticed that they were completely empty. That was when it hit me. We never got a new garbage man. This guy started stealing our trash. He must be emptying out in his own house for whatever reason. This honestly really freaked me out. I had no idea what to do about it. I started driving the trash to the dump just to avoid having to bring those garbage cans down. A couple weeks of doing that, and I noticed that the old man seems to be less active around his own house. I don't know what he was trying to do, but it still freaks me out thinking about it to this day. As of late, I've seen a fair amount of posts from the perspective of criminals. These posts have inspired me to share a story about a scary incident I had as a kid, and how I became a better man because of it. Between 10 and 16, I spent more time inside of juvenile than I did in school. I had been born into a world of petty crime. All of those around me, including my own folks, had been in the penitentiary at least once and I never really had known any other life. My friends and I had a little gang that we called the Breakers. As you can probably tell from the name, we specialized in burglary, and we thought that we were the princes of crime. Stupid and cringeworthy when you look back on it, but no one dared challenge the idea. Depending on the location and the size of the job, we often worked in two or three man teams. On one break-in in particular, we had received information from a girl that we knew very well that a family was going to be out of town for the weekend. From what the couple had told her, the husband was, and had been for a long time, an avid gun collector. Now, any crook you talk to can tell you guns are a good source of quick cash, so we did a short casing of the place and chose that weekend for the robbery. Unfortunately, the other two guys I was planning to work with got really sick, and I was left alone to get as much as I could in the amount of time that we had allotted for the job. I had even considered going for a second night in a row, but circumstances you will soon see put that idea to rest. Two nights later, the moment had arrived to go in. I slipped in through the back sliding door, and the steady rainstorm that evening kept any nosy neighbors inside. The only thing I didn't know was the location of the guns. I figured a guy that serious about firearms would have at least one safe, so I kept my eyes open for one. One by one, I rummaged through each room I came to. No doors were closed, 
making it all the easier. Frankly, I was surprised at the lack of any real valuables and focused on the search for guns. Finally, I discovered an upright safe and to my great joy, found that it was unlocked. I was counting the money in my head, but that was as far as I would ever get. To my right, in the hallway, I heard a sound no burglar hopes to ever hear. The racking of a shotgun. I froze the second I realized what it was. Now, I was counting my last few seconds alive, rather than the money. The racking was quickly followed by an older gentleman's voice saying, Stop right there, kid. If you move, I will kill you. I have no doubt that he would have, too. Look at me, son. I'm going to give you one chance. Someone did the same for me once, and I'm going to do the same for you. However, if I see you again in this house, uninvited, you will not leave alive. I wasn't sure whether I was more terrified or shocked by what he said. As I stared into his weathered eyes, I got the feeling that he himself had seen his share of hard times as a kid and may have been in the exact same position I was now in at one point. Do you understand me? His words were crystal clear. The overwhelming feeling. I was being given an opportunity many in my trade were not given. It poured over me. I simply nodded at him, but was still too terrified to move, and he had to urge me to leave. Well, get the hell out of here. That was all I needed. I ran as fast as possible out of the house into my car down the block. The fear that he was about to shoot me in the back was there the entire time, but I had to take the chance. While I sat there in my car, I juggled the importance of the scene around in my head. I had just been handed a once in a lifetime opportunity. I feared that if I had squandered it, my punishment for doing so might be terrible. Although I had never been a religious kid, and still ain't, for that matter, I knew that some higher power had to have just stepped in and handed me my life. I've never questioned who he was or what he was doing there. From that night forward, I resolved to change my life for the better. To be honest with you, it was a damn hard path to follow. When you know nothing other than doing bad, doing good is twice as hard. Those around me were in no way happy to hear my epiphany, and I got a lot of grief for it. I eventually realized that I was never going to achieve what I wanted if I stayed where I was. So I took the little bit of cash that I had saved and moved on. I drove halfway across the country, looking for a place that I liked, and finally landed in Colorado. The utter beauty of the place was unlike anywhere I had ever seen, and I've been here ever since. While I never became a wealthy man, I did find a legit way to make money and hope to retire in the next 10 years. If anyone is wondering why I'm sharing this, it's not because I want people to think that I'm a great guy for turning my back on crime. Actually, a lot of great fellows I knew were crooks but most were lowlifes that wasted their lives in jail. My real purpose is to impress upon the younger members of the life that you can change your life for the better. Your past and upbringing don't dictate your future, and not every square citizen has written you off. If you want to turn your life around, do it, and if someone offers you a lifeline, take it. You will not regret it. Good luck to you all, and don't be afraid to believe in yourself. I'm not sure if I'm being stalked or somebody's just trying to scare me. I don't know if I've ever met this person in question, but for a bit of context, 
I'm a 22-year-old queer dude with a cocktail of mental illnesses and drug problems. The main illness that affects me on a daily basis is BPD, Borderline Personality Disorder, which comes with, in my case, pretty intense paranoia, low self-esteem, and a confusing mix of wanting affection constantly, but also not trusting anybody. I've used Grindr and other dating and hooking up apps since I was 18, and have admittedly had a lot of sexual encounters and casual relationships, many of whose names I probably couldn't even remember. So to my encounter, this all started in late November, early December of last year, and has been a constant feature in my day-to-day -day life since. I received a message on Grindr from a blank profile. No pic, no info, nothing. The message simply read, I know who you are, followed by a picture of my face. I believe it was a picture from my old Facebook account. Bearing in mind, my profile didn't have a face pic, as I like to stay under the radar on those kinds of apps due to family and friends. I had no idea how to respond, so I didn't. A day passed, and nothing more had happened, so I shrugged it off as somebody just messing around. But then later that day, I received another message. Why are you ignoring me? This time I responded, because I was admittedly a bit on guard, and started to panic. I said something along the lines of, Yeah, whatever, you know who I am, so? At this point, I just blocked them, half because it was just a bit weird, and half because I was scared of what they would say back. Nothing else occurred over the next few days, and I was relieved because I had been pretty shaken by the whole thing. It may seem like nothing to some people, but it really did affect me. My paranoia and general distrust of everybody obviously played into this. I was at a friend's house when I received my next creepy message. This time, a text message from a contactless number. Hey you, why did you block me? At this point, the slight feeling of unease escalated into genuine concern and obsessive thoughts about who this could be, why they were messaging me like this, and how they A. knew who I was from my grinder profile, and B. how they got my number. I didn't tell my friend about this. I just put my phone away and carried on like nothing was wrong. But I think he knew something was wrong, because he kept asking if I was okay or I needed a glass of water because I was pale and clammy and had gotten really quiet. In the following weeks, I received more messages off different grinder accounts, presumably the same person. Messages along the same lines of, I know who you are, don't ignore me, I'll keep coming back. It was coming up to Christmas and I just couldn't be doing with it anymore so I deleted my Grindr account. I made a new Snapchat and I changed my number. I was meant to be enjoying time with the family, not being scared and suspicious of everybody in my life. Over Christmas Eve and up to towards the new year, nothing happened. I assumed they got bored. But then in early January, it started up again with the same old routine. Text messages this time which scared me because I had changed my number, and I think the number that I was receiving them from was different from the first time around. This time, they were much more threatening, not in a violent way, but by the fact that they seemed to know my movements and my whereabouts. I'd go shopping, and I'd get home and check my phone and see a text that would read, I saw you shopping at Hartley Shopping Center today. I like your jeans. The frequency seems to have simmered down slightly, however, and I'll now receive a text maybe two or three times a week instead of nearly every day. But they just seem so threatening. 
as if they're trying to let me know that they can get to me wherever and whenever they want, whoever they are. So this is pretty much where I am now, still receiving those weird threatening texts, sometimes from several different numbers. I've run the numbers through Facebook and found nothing. I've googled the numbers and again found nothing. I'm thinking they may be using a random number generator. I have no idea who this could be. Is it someone I've hooked up with who has been fixated? Or a friend trying to mess with me? Somebody I've never met who knows who I am for whatever reason? I don't know if I will ever know. Just a little disclaimer before I begin this story. I know that the decisions we made were not all the brightest. In fact, they were utterly idiotic, and we should have known better. In fact, we did know better, but we were in a summer party mode and decided to throw all caution to the wind. That was probably the worst mistake we ever made. About a week ago, my friend Sadie and I were hanging out running around the area that we live in. After a long day of walking in the sun, smoking weed, and having a good time, we decided to head to her mom's house, which is in a major city about 20 minutes away from where I lived, and Sadie's grandma that she was staying with lived. Neither of us have cars, so we were forced to use public transit to make the commute to her mom's house. Now, we were not at all new to riding the Trimit, so we knew our way around the system very well. In order to get to her mom's, we needed to take a bus to the local mall, where we could catch a train into the city. Mind you, it was around 11 p.m. at this point, and we were worried that buses would stop running before we got home, so we resolved to call her mom at the train station and ask her to pick us up. We got on our first bus to head to the mall, and quickly noticed that a friend of ours was sitting in the back, talking to some friends. So we went and sat by him to talk for a while. After a few stops, a guy got on and instantly came to the back of the bus where we were. I'm assuming because we all looked about his age. We began talking to him, primarily about drugs, and one by one, the rest of the people in the back got off, leaving me and Sadie with this guy. He eventually proposed that we come with him to his friend's house to hang out and smoke some weed. He said that his house was only a short walk from the mall, and that we could come and hang out for a little bit before we headed back to the station to get picked up. For some godforsaken reason, we agreed and got off with him at the mall. The walk to his friend's house was fine for the most part. The guy, whose name was Kyle, was really nice and funny. Just seemed like a kid that wanted to hang out with some girls. The only thing I found concerning was the fact that he had said it was a short walk, but it took us about 20 minutes to get to his friend's house from the mall. I didn't think much of it, though. I figured that just wasn't long for him. Eventually, we reached his friend's house, whose name was Tyler and Kyle went to his window and knocked on it to get Tyler's attention, but Tyler wasn't home. Eventually, Tyler showed up, and we walked over to the swimming pool that was in his apartment complex to hang out there for some reason. The pool was closed at 10, and no one has swimming clothes, so we really just went there to sit on the couch that was there. It was pretty weird, but I was like, oh well, they're just edgy and like to hang out in places they're not supposed to. We pretty much just sat there and talked until the security guard came and told us to leave. From what we could tell at this point, Tyler seemed cool, like Kyle. He was funny and seemed like a generally laid back kind of guy, so we were having fun. After the security guard at his apartment told us to leave, we actually ended up walking to the apartments across the street and going to their pool. I was nervous at first. I'm not one that particularly enjoys being caught trespassing, especially when I'm under 21 and have weed on me. 
but Kyle and Tyler assured us that everything was fine and that they hung out there all the time so we didn't need to worry. We sat in chairs by the hot tub and decided to smoke some weed. His weed was weird looking, but it didn't look like spice, so I figured it was just some outdoor homegrown stuff. We were all having a good time getting high, but then all of a sudden Tyler says, I'm going to kill you guys, which seems harmless if he was just reacting to something that someone said, but no one was even talking to him. Sadie and Kyle were having a conversation, and I was looking for music to play. Being a very paranoid person, I was instantly put on edge. I looked over at Sadie to gauge her reaction, but she hadn't heard him and was continuing her conversation with Kyle, who I'm assuming hadn't heard him either. It was weird and it freaked me out, but I figured it wasn't a big deal and I brushed it off. I ended up talking to Tyler about what music he listened to, because I commented on the corn shirt he was wearing, saying that I also liked that band. Every single band he told me made horror, murder, rap, or rock, which I like too, but he seemed really into the lyrics, which made me even more freaked out by the comment he made earlier, but again I brushed it off. Eventually we decided to head back to his apartment and hang out there but he warned us that we would need to be quiet because he lived with his parents and they were sleeping. When we got there, we had to sneak in, but earlier he had made it seem like it was okay for us to be there. We just had to be quiet. So the situation was immediately uncomfortable. Sneaking into someone's house is just a little too edgy teen for my taste. But regardless, we snuck in and into his room where we all sat on a bed in a suffocatingly awkward silence for like 10 minutes, the only noise being laughs escaping Sadie and I every few minutes, when we would look over at each other and communicate how awkward the situation was with our eyes. Every time we would laugh though, no matter how quiet we were, Tyler would angrily shush us. Eventually, to break the silence, I asked if they wanted to smoke more weed, and they said yeah. So we started smoking the stuff I had brought, and I started to get stoned, like I mean blazed, and that's why I'm so confused about what happened next. I asked Tyler if we could listen to some music, and lo and behold, he started playing some insane clown posse. That's when he started getting really weird. I was the only one listening, because Kyle had passed out at this point. It was nearly 3 a.m., and we were all really stoned, and Sadie wasn't paying attention. Tyler started saying, I'm going to get one of you, and pointed at us all, one by one, with a finger gun while laughing. At one point, he literally said, I'm going to shoot one of you tonight. At this point, I was really on edge. My adrenaline was pumping, and I knew I had to get us out of there. I kept waiting until he wasn't looking, and nudging Sadie to get her attention, and mouthing, he's weird, to her. At first, she looked confused but eventually she caught on and began shooting alarmed looks my way. Shortly after she realized what I was talking about, Tyler stood up and put a stool ladder thing under his doorknob so it wouldn't open from the outside and started reaching into his closet while laughing. I immediately went into survival mode and grabbed the knife I had in my pocket and I opened it, keeping it concealed. It was like everything was moving in slow motion and his hand came out of the closet, holding a Nerf gun. I almost started laughing, I was so relieved. But then he proceeded to point it at all of us, then turns the lights off, and leaves the room. My first thought was that although the gun was fake, he could be going to go get the real thing right now. I immediately told Sadie that we needed to leave now. This was difficult though, because she was lightheaded and thought that if she stood up she would pass out, and we were both really high. I was just standing there saying we need to go now, over and over, until she stood up and we rushed out of his room. We ran into him in the hallway, and I immediately gave him some excuse that I had an emergency and needed to leave. We rushed out and got far away from that place as fast as we could. 
This quickly turned into one of the worst nights of my life, as we were two severely intoxicated girls walking down unfamiliar roads at three in the morning, with no protection but one knife, and what little strength we had. We were both incredibly dehydrated and hyped up on adrenaline, and this was not mixing well with our highs. We eventually ended up outside of a hospital that was on a busy street across from a hotel with a gas station shortly down the road. So there were a good amount of people around and cars driving past us often. We decided that this would be our safe place and that we would wait here until the train started running so we could walk to the station at the mall and get to her mom's house. Things were just really bad. We were both nearly passing out on the sidewalk from exhaustion and dehydration. I started throwing up in the bushes and fighting panic attacks every two minutes, and we were very vulnerable. We eventually walked to the gas station and asked the guy if we could get a cup of water, because we had no money. He was very kind and allowed us to. I'm going to cut this story short, because I know the rest of this doesn't have much to do with the actual encounter with Tyler. But long story short, we eventually made it to her mom's house. We were finally safe, and I don't know if I've ever felt so relieved and comforted in my life. This story that I'm going to share makes my skin crawl and my whole insides cringe just thinking about it. I grew up in a small town in New Zealand and had recently moved to a big city for a university. The town I grew up in was really rough and a gang-oriented place, so I was always somewhat weary of strangers. However, not little old white men in mobility scooters. Living in a big city was awesome because I got to go shopping in malls and Kmart. Kmart in New Zealand is probably the equivalent of Walmart in the US but us Kiwis seem to love it a lot. One day I was shopping at Kmart, looking at the dog beds, which were at the back aisle of the store. Kmart is huge, and the back aisle is the entire length of the store. I get this feeling I am being watched, and I see an old man in a mobility scooter, at the opposite end, staring at me. I gave him a smile and turned back to browsing when in my peripheral I see him racing towards me in his scooter at a great speed. I immediately assumed that his urgency must mean he needs some help reaching or finding something, so I turned to face him. He was a harmless old man, right? Wrong. He quickly starts chatting to me and sharing personal things with me without actually grieving me. He starts telling me how I look like his wife who had passed when she was younger. Then he starts telling me how lonely he is, so I start to feel so much pity for him, and then the conversation starts taking a weird turn. He starts to tell me how he likes to dress up and feel sexy in women's clothing. Then he starts to open his mouth and show me his missing teeth and his gums. The sudden turn of conversation startles me, and I start to realize that I need to end this and leave him immediately. After several attempts at saying goodbye, he finally agrees to let me go and holds out his hand for a goodbye handshake. Desperate to leave, I agree to shake his hand in order to leave him alone. Suddenly his grip tightens and I can't pull my hand away. He forces my hand towards his mouth and begins to make out with the back of it while swishing his tongue across it in circles. I aggressively pull my hand back and sprint out of the store in shock. The air from running makes the back of my hand feel cold and slimy. So I run to the mall toilets and scrub my hand for a solid 10 minutes, vowing to never let him talk to me again. So I thought I'd never see him again until just recently I did. I was on the bus to you and I when he gets on without his mobility scooter and a walking stick instead. Thankfully, I had someone already sitting next to me, so I felt safe. However, his eyes scanned the bus, and when they met mine, he immediately smiled. So when the bus got to the interchange, 
where everybody gets off and gets on. I quickly rushed off the bus so I wouldn't have to see him. I felt my stomach hit the floor when I hear him calling after me. I glance over my shoulder to see him waving his walking stick, yelling and pursing after me. I quickly rush out into the shopping store to lose him, which is a success. The rest of the day goes fine until I go to return home and see that he is waiting at the stop that I board my bus at. I hide until I can see my bus coming. He is looking around and starts to wander away from the bus stop, which is my cue to board quickly. I jump in line and quickly board. However, he has spotted me and is waving his stick and yelling after me. I start to panic as I don't want to be trapped on a bus with him. He's just about to step on the bus when the driver all of a sudden slams the door on him. This makes him furious and he starts smashing his stick against the window and shouting. I look at the driver who smiles and me gives him a nod and starts to pull away onto the road. I am overjoyed that this kind driver has literally just saved me from this creepy old man. So I step up to the window he's hitting and stare directly at him with the filthiest look I can give him while the bus slowly drives away. I literally felt like I got my power back. I later found out that this old man is a well-known creep in the community, which makes me so grateful that the bus driver saved me that day. I'm a young girl in my late teens, and I grew up in a pretty small city, which gets even smaller when the Queen students leave for the summer. Ontario is home to Queen's University, which means that I'm not typically alone at night when I go out on my late night endeavors. However, once those students are gone for the summer, I tend to find myself in riskier situations with rougher looking people. It's almost as if when the students leave, the crazies come back. I'm a huge advocate of exploration, and I explore every single chance I can get. This hobby of mine has gotten me into trouble more than a few times, and I'm honestly lucky to still remain unscathed by any insane person to this day. There are quite a few abandoned buildings in my city, which nearly anyone who is interested in horror and adventure would love to find their way inside of. I have an eye for detail, and I am only around 5'1 and 116 pounds, so that makes me the perfect candidate to escape into the small crevices and holes of abandoned buildings. Not too long ago, I had found a building I was scoping out for a while. I found my way in with little effort and understood the dangers of going alone. I am a risk taker, but I'm not stupid. So of course I had someone with me. Now let's just say I wasn't expecting this person to be as flaky and easily frightened as they were. So most of the rooms I entered, I had to enter on my own. Equipped with a flashlight and a bag, in case I found anything super interesting. I explored the dark corners of this building that I didn't expect to be so huge. I found a journal with writing in it that looked to be like a foreign language. And even with my knowledge of different languages, I couldn't decipher what this person was going on about. I also saw multiple mathematical formulas, but with a type of math that I hadn't seen before, surrounded by odd symbols and drawings. There was also a ton of zodiac signs, and talking of the planets and their rotation, which was enough to put me off in itself, due to the fact that my own zodiac sign was heavily underlined and rewritten multiple times. Of course I didn't piece anything together here, because it's extremely unlikely anyone would be in the building with me. But I started to feel even more on edge as the night crawled on. I make it a promise to myself to check every room, because I didn't crawl into a dark hole for nothing. My friend had opted in staying near the entrance, and I obliged simply because arguing would lead to noise, and noise led to alerting others of my presence. I continued looking amongst this dark, eerie building, 
which contained this thick air that I almost felt like I had to sift through, as if it was a thick, visible fog. I had already seen a bed, clothing, books, stickers, anything you can think of, but abandoned buildings commonly house these items, as I'm not unfamiliar with squatters staying places for a few days, then moving on. However, in all of my years of exploration, I never encountered someone who stayed in a building or approached me in a building that I entered. I started to get deeper into the building. I went down the stairs and walked down a dark, wet hallway. I felt like I had been here for hours, that there couldn't be anything else that I hadn't explored already. As I got further away from not only my friend, but the exit as well, my basic senses started to heighten. I thought it may have been due to this that I started to smell a disgusting odor near me, one that I hadn't noticed upon initially entering. I was stuck in a hallway with little places to go, so I entered another room, hoping to escape the smell. However, the smell started to turn into footsteps, and I realized the room I was now standing in was barricaded in some way with mattresses against the walls piled on top of one another needles around my feet, and children's toys scattered carelessly. No red flags go off in my head when I'm in an abandoned building, until I stumble upon children's clothing or children's toys. That's where I always draw the line. I turned around and told myself it was time to leave, but I didn't feel like it was just me that was going to be leaving. I started walking back the way I came, finding my way through the mess and the clutter, the disgusting odors and tapping of feet and plunking of water. I hated it there. I hated the buildings I explored that only had one exit. I knew if I made one wrong move it could lead to something awful, so I didn't turn around. At this point, either due to adrenaline or my senses heightening, which I believe to have been connected to my adrenaline kicking in, I could literally feel somebody behind me. I heard, I smelled, and felt the presence of somebody walking no more than six feet behind me. At this point I picked up my pace, but in a way that wouldn't be too obvious, and when I reached the exit I cannot explain the euphoria I felt. It was such a relief to see my friend and tell her to get the heck out of here. As soon as I started making my way to the hole to exit, I felt a strong grip on my right leg and my heart literally stopped. Whoever was in this building had clearly been following me and watching me the entire time, but didn't bother touching me until the second I tried to leave. I didn't even look back, I just started kicking my leg and screaming. At this point I didn't care about people hearing me. My friend quickly caught on and started screaming too, then reached for both of my hands. Whoever had been gripping my leg had gripped me so hard when I finally broke loose, there were red indents on my calf. We went home and literally didn't speak another word about it. Actually, I tried changing the subject in my shivery voice. Because I was so scared, whoever this person was would have been following us home too. Long story short, we weren't followed anymore. And my friend proposed that it may have been somebody else exploring. Or a teenager up to no good that wanted to scare me by following me and grabbing me so I would assume I was in danger. Personally, I don't believe that. No normal person smells that horrible, or has that much time to follow around a girl through an abandoned building that, to my initial inspection, had been abandoned for nearly three years. I assumed it was safe since there was no sign of anyone for so long. The next morning there were purple bruises on my leg. I didn't go to the police because it's not a great impression to be entering abandoned buildings in the first place. I don't know what to make of this experience, but I am so happy I'm alive, and whoever that was didn't grab me sooner. Always, always bring somebody with you when you explore buildings. If it wasn't for my friend grabbing me, I don't know if I would have been able to kick my way out of there.
My crazy story began when my family and I moved to another church when I was about 16. The youth president from said church started to be really friendly and would appear wherever I was at the church. If I went to the parking lot, he was there. If I went to the bathroom, he was there. If I went inside the church through the back door, he was there. I never thought he was stalkerish, just annoying. For about a year, this guy followed me around, and he would leave gifts on the hood of my car, gifts that I would get and throw in the trash immediately. He wasn't that bad, so I never told anyone. I was very innocent and naive. Then, along came a new guy to our church. There was something weird about him, like his eyes were dead. He reminded me of a zombie. I never talked to him, ever, but he took an interest in me. He started sending me gifts with the children from church, taking my Bible and putting love letters inside, and then have a child return it, leaving letters on top of my car. Again, I just brushed it off. The real problem began when both stalkers realized they both loved and stalked the same girl, so they became friends. My best friend, brother of the first stalker, would tell me that the newer stalker would go over to their house, where both stalkers would watch the church's YouTube channel and look for bits of clips where I would come out. Then they would edit all the little clips and make a video of just me and add photos they had of me and then proceed to watch their homemade video for hours. They would talk about how God had sent me for them and that I was supposed to be their wife. Again, it wasn't that bad, just very, very creepy. I guess being a giant creep wasn't enough for the new stalker, because he began making up stories about me and telling the first stalker. He would say that we were actually dating, and that he had met my parents and that he was always at my house. The first stalker would believe him and get very upset. One day the newer stalker called the first stalker and said he was going to go to my house and if I didn't come outside to talk to him, he would commit suicide. He was saying all sorts of crazy things, and he was crying so the first stalker got very scared. They were friends after all, and told his mom about it, and they proceeded to make guard outside my house for hours in the middle of the night. This happened on more than five occasions. My best friend didn't tell me all of this until later because he didn't want to scare me. Obviously, the new stalker never went to my house, but I guess this made the first stalker up his game. He was in charge of driving the church van whenever the youth groups had outings. On our way back from one of the outings, he realized that I was sitting in the very back of the van with a male friend. He stopped the van in the middle of the road and told me that I wasn't allowed to sit with any males, so I needed to move to the front of the van next to him. Of course, I said no. He said he wouldn't take me home until I moved. I told him I wasn't moving and that he needed to take me home or I would call my parents. He said no and then started begging me to please sit with him. I got off the van and waited for my mom to come pick me up. The other people in the van did nothing to help me out. My parents had a long talk with him and threatened to press charges if he ever got close to me, so he stopped, just like that. The newer stalker saw an opportunity and he took it. On most mornings, I would wake up to broken eggs on my car, and neighbors told my parents that a random car would park in front of my house late at night and then randomly leave. I would get about 20 calls a day from unknown numbers. I started being paranoid. I was scared of coming out of my house because I thought he could be watching me. I hated going to church because all he did was stare at me with his zombie-like eyes. I stopped going out at night because I knew he was around. He started making fake profiles on Facebook and sending me friend requests. I knew it was him. One day he stopped going to church. He just kind of disappeared. And he stopped stalking me, just like that. I guess he found another person to stalk. It took a long while for me to understand that he had stopped, to not be looking over my shoulder to see if he was around. It was a relief to not see broken eggs on my car every morning, to not feel his gaze fixated on me at church. It has been about eight years since I last saw them, and I finally feel more at peace. Every now and then, though, 
I'll get a random Facebook request from a profile, and I know that it's him. I went on a school trip to Scotland my senior year in high school. I'm American. And our last night there, I had easily one of the most unsettling experiences of my life. There were probably about 15 students on the trip, and we had three teachers with us. We went all over Scotland, staying in different hostels and with locals that the teachers had gotten to know over the years that they'd been running this trip. So the last night we were staying in Edinburgh. The girls all stayed in one room, the boys in one, and the teachers in another. Since it was the last night, me and the rest of the girls all were planning on staying up late to finish the journals, the projects, and assignments that we would have to turn in the next day. It was really, really hot that day, about 80, which I understand to be unusual for that area, so the hostel didn't have air conditioning. Because it was so hot, all of us ended up sitting around in mostly our underwear, like sports bras and spandex, to avoid dying from the stagnant heat on the top floor of this hostel, with no air conditioning and windows that didn't open. At some point, my friend Ellie's boyfriend, Jack, texted her and said he was coming up to say goodnight. A couple minutes later, there was a knock on the door, so Ellie answered, thinking it was Jack. But it was an Asian man that none of us recognized. When Ellie opened the door, I was sitting next to it with my backpack against the wall. So I was sitting feet away from the man in my underwear, in plain sight, and I looked up to find him staring at me. The weirdest part was he didn't say anything. He probably didn't speak English, but still. When Ellie said something like, Oh, hi, can we help you? He just stood there silently. At this point, Jack comes down the hall and sees the guy at our door. And when the man sees Jack, he just turns around and walks back down the hall. All of us were kind of like, that was weird. But we just assumed that he was lost and didn't speak English. So he mistook our room for his. Ellie steps out into the hall and closes the door to talk to Jack. But pretty soon we can hear Jack saying, Hey man, what are you doing? Or something like that. And I open the door enough to report to everyone that the man is back, standing in the hallway with Ellie and Jack. Our room was at the very end of the hallway, and the door was a good 20 yards from any other doors to rooms. So there really was no reason for the man to be there. Ellie comes back inside and Jack talks to the guy for a minute, but everything he says is in extremely broken English, and Jack can't understand him at all, so we just lock our door and Jack goes to bed. It's probably 2 to 3 a.m. at this point, so it's even weirder that this man is just wandering around. We all put t-shirts and shorts on at this point, now that we're anxious about this strange guy. No more than 20 minutes later, there's a knock on the door and Ellie opens it again because Jack had left his charger with her, and she thought he might come back for it. And it was the man again. This time Ellie goes to shut the door immediately, when she sees it's him, but he grabs the door and says with a thick accent, Let in. Ellie forcefully closes the door, and I scooted a foot over to sit in front of it, while she locked it, with my back against it so he can't open the door, before she gets it locked because there was no deadbolt. Everyone in the room is now just staring at each other, silent and wide-eyed. Then the man starts banging on the door, screaming, Let in! Let in! He's obviously pounding with his fist, and I can feel him hit the door with his full body weight, trying to get it open. Everyone in the room is frozen, and we expected it to just pass, but after about five minutes of the relentless yelling and banging, I said someone needs to call a teacher. So another girl tries to give a teacher a call, but we're in Scotland, so we don't have any service. We text the teachers hoping they'll wake up, and then send a text to the group message of students on the trip, telling them that there was a man trying to get into our room, and that we needed to get a teacher up here as fast as we can to help. Apparently Jack had been uncomfortable with the man since he met him in the hall, and had been up thinking about it. So we saw the text pretty quickly and went to our teacher's room. The banging had been going on continuously for about 15 minutes by the time a teacher was on his way to our room. 
but all of a sudden the banging just stopped. Twenty seconds later, there's a polite knock on the door, and everyone in the room stays silent until our teacher says it's him. We open the door and can see the man walking back down the hallway, and I point him out to our teacher, but there's nothing he can really do since the man stopped and didn't speak English. Our teacher told us to text him if it happened again, and he would contact the hostel staff to get the man removed, but it never happened again. I still wonder why that man was doing it. There's a possibility that he was genuinely convinced that our room was his, but he would have had a key that he realized didn't work instead of just banging on the door. It all was just generally a very strange and unsettling experience. This happened probably about 15 years ago, pre-cell phone days. My mom and I had gone to a movie at the movie theater by my house in the evening. It was so fun and I really enjoyed our time. My parents were really awesome and took us out for outings like this on occasion, sometimes as a whole family, sometimes just one-on-one. -on -one. The movie theater we had gone to had one of those Dance Dance Revolution games, and at the time I was in love with those games. I begged my mom to let me play it, just once, before we went home. She said yes, and stood to the side of the machine while I booted up the game. I was wearing terrible shoes to play. They were like dress shoes with a slight heel, and so I didn't do very well. So I only wanted to play one round and then leave. As I was playing, a man had walked to my mom and had started a conversation. I have no idea what it was about but my mom is a very polite person. And so she made small talk as she waited for me to finish up. I finished and we went to make our exit, and this is where it got weird. The movie theater itself did not have a very big lobby, but it had two sets of doors with parking lots on either side. The front door came out into a larger shopping complex, parking lot, and then the back door faced out into a small parking lot with overflow parking across the street. The doors to both sides were also flanked by very large, floor-to-ceiling windows that allowed pretty good eyesight into the parking lots. I thank God we had parked in the front parking lot, because at the time there was not much happening in the back, and way less people. The man had walked out with us to the parking lot, to go to his truck. As a child, my siblings and I were always taught to be wary of strangers, even the ones that seemed kind. For that reason, I was very on edge that this man continued to walk with us and make conversation with a woman and her young child. I kept thinking that I should say I had to go to the bathroom so we could go back inside the busy, well-lit theater. My mom must have been thinking the same thing and stopped very abruptly and said to the man that she had forgotten something inside the theater and very firmly and quickly led me back into the movies and into the woman's bathroom. We got inside the woman's bathroom my mother very quickly explained to me that the man had been digging around in his pockets and kept saying that he couldn't remember where his truck was. My mom explained to me that she did not want the man to know what our car looked like. I suspect now that she was worried that he would overpower us and force his way into the car. He was probably 300 pounds easy. I was a very anxious child and having my gut feeling confirmed by my mom set me into hysterics. I was crying hysterically and begging my mom to please tell the theater and have us walked out to our car or have them let her use their phone to call my dad to come meet us. Kudos to my mom who I know was very scared and said so but told me to remain calm and we would wait inside the theater for a little bit so she could think about what to do. Holding my hands she led a now terrified me into the lobby and looked out the window. The man was standing a ways away from the door. We stood back from the windows, so to this day I'm not sure if he could see us or not. I was frantic at this, and I was convinced that harm would come to both of us. My mom told me not to worry, and that we would stay in the theater as long as we needed to. Finally, after what seemed like a good 30 minutes, the man gave up and walked out into the parking lot. We remained inside the theater after he had walked away for a good 15 minutes. We left as other people were leaving and made our way to the car swiftly. Obviously the man did not follow us or cause us any harm, but my mom was very frightened. 
When we got home, my dad was upset that this happened. She and I both are reserved people, so I'm sure the reason my mom didn't say much to the theater or call my dad is because she didn't want to make a scene or cause any trouble. I am thankful she has taught me street smarts, and they have saved me from a lot of situations as I got older and did not have her by my side. The best advice she would give me was that any decent person would not be offended by a young girl or woman being afraid of them or declining to help them, as they would understand why. Hey everyone, it's Being Scared. I hope you enjoyed the video. And if you enjoy my videos and you haven't subscribed yet, please don't forget to do that. Subscribing and then hitting the bell to turn on notifications will let you know immediately when I put out a new video. Have a great night.